Have you ever wondered who developed the best early jet engine? Have you thought which country had the better breakthrough and what came of it? Welcome back to the Jackson Talks channel. Today we look into the British development of jet fighters during World War II, from Whittle's patent to the Gloucester Meteor. The genesis of the gas turbine, Frank Whittle and the pre-war struggle 1932-1939. The foundation of British jet propulsion during World War II was laid by the conceptual brilliance of Frank Whittle. Whittle was a young Royal Air Force flying officer whose early efforts were met with institutional resistance. This led to a critical technological lag just prior to the conflict. Whittle's initial concept, detailed in his final thesis during pilot training, envisioned the use of gas pressure for the propulsion of aircraft at the high speeds and high altitudes necessary for future combat and long-range flight. The theoretical blueprint for the modern turbojet was secured by Whittle on January 16, 1930, when he obtained a foundational British patent for his design. This initial sketch detailed all the essential components still used in jet engines today, a compressor, a combustion chamber, a turbine, and an outlet nozzle. However, despite the revolutionary nature of the concept, government and industry authorities largely dismissed Whittle. This was in part because earlier attempts to develop gas turbines had failed, due to the inability of contemporary metallurgy required to handle the extreme temperatures for efficient operation. This institutional skepticism and the lack of financial support culminated in a major historical inflection point. Whittle had to allow his groundbreaking 1930 patent to lapse in 1935 because he could not afford the necessary renewal fee. The consequence of this financial constraint was that Whittle was forced to rely on private backing. With a lenient allowance from the RAF, he pursued his work, resulting in the establishment of Power Jets Limited on January 27, 1936. This allowed him to develop the concept into a practical engine. Work commenced on the first bench test the Whittle unit or WU engine. This first successful, although terrifying, ground run occurred on April 12, 1937. Whittle described the experience, saying the engine accelerated with a rising shriek like an air raid siren until it was obviously out of control. These early tests, while proving mechanical feasibility, highlighted significant challenges related to combustion control, which took until around 1939 to resolve. This period of slow, underfunded development contrasted sharply with parallel efforts in Germany. While Whittle struggled to secure his patents and funding, German designer Hans von Nahein succeeded in launching the Heinkel He-178 aircraft, powered by his own jet engine, on August 27, 1939. This milestone flight, occurring immediately before the outbreak of World War II, officially established Germany's lead in jet propulsion technology. This initial defeat necessitated that the British Air Ministry rapidly accelerate the jet program after war began. This turned what had been a long-term curiosity project into an emergency strategic priority, thereby shaping the rapid, yet compromise-laden path of subsequent British jet fighter development. The Pioneer aircraft, Gloucester E-2839 and the proof of concept 1942-1941, the need to catch up with Germany led the Air Ministry to commit official support to Whittle's turbojet program following the outbreak of war. This support focused on developing an experimental single-seat, high-speed interceptor, initially defined by a 1937 Air Ministry requirement. The Gloucester Aircraft Company, under the direction of chief designer George Carter, was selected to build the airframe. Carter made a key early decision to adopt a conventional mid-winged monoplane layout, successfully arguing against more radical ideas, such as a canard design. This was to simplify development and reduce the unknowns that are inherent in mating a completely new propulsion system to an airframe. The resulting aircraft, the Gloucester E-2839, sometimes called the Gloucester Whittle, was built around Whittle's experimental W-1 engine. The W-1 was a centrifugal flow turbojet design, structurally defined by a single stage, double entry centrifugal compressor and 10 reverse flow combustion chambers. This single-engine prototype successfully conducted the first British jet flight on May 15, 1941. Gloucester's chief test pilot, Flight Lieutenant Philip Lucas, was at the controls. For safety during the critical first flight, the W-1 engine was intentionally derated, producing 850 pounds foot of thrust at 16,500 revolutions per minute, though its full rating was 1,240 foot-pound of thrust. The flight validated the jet concept, with the aircraft achieving a top speed of approximately 400 miles per hour or 640 kilometers per hour. However, the operational viability of the W-1 was quickly questioned. The low thrust generated by the single engine was recognized as insufficient for a true high-performance interceptor of the era. This technical constraint was acknowledged by the Air Ministry as early as the end of 1940. This led to a crucial strategic decision before the E-2839 even flew. 
there was an immediate allocation of resources to fund the development of a higher thrust, twin-engine fighter, designated the F940 Meteor. Consequently, the E2839 role was limited to technological validation. It was not developed further for operational service. The importance of this pioneering work extended beyond Britain's shores. The high strategic value of the technology was immediately underlined by a rapid and highly classified technological transfer to the United States. In October 1941, an early development engine, the W1X, was shipped across the Atlantic. This engine was provided to General Electric in Massachusetts, initiating the US Jet Propulsion Program, the clandestine effort known as the Hush Hush Boys. This collaboration established a pivotal Anglo-American technology alliance, ensuring that the Allies collectively maintained control over the foundational knowledge of reliable jet propulsion, significantly influencing post-war military and commercial aviation. The industrialization challenge, from W2 to the Welland and Derwent 1942-1943. The immediate recognition that the single-engine E-2839 concept was underpowered spurred the Air Ministry to issue specification F940 in November 1940, calling for a twin-engine operational jet fighter. Gloucester responded with the G41, which became the Gloucester Meteor. Simultaneously, Power Jets was authorized to design the higher thrust W2 engine, specifically for the new F940 airframe. This commitment was solidified with an early and ambitious procurement strategy of 12 prototypes that were ordered in February 1941. This was followed by a substantial order for 300 Meteor F Mark I's in August 1941. This was an unprecedented decision given the immaturity of the airframe and the production engine. The W-2 retained the foundational centrifugal flow concept established by Whittle in the W-1, aiming for increased power while maintaining reliability through reverse flow combustion. The initial manufacturing contract for the W-2 was awarded to the Rover Car Company in the early 1940s. However, Rover proved to be a critical bottleneck. The relationship between Whittle's design team at Power Jets and Rover's manufacturing division became severely antagonistic and strained, resulting in painfully slow developmental progress. This period demonstrated a crucial principle in wartime innovation. Revolutionary technology demands not only scientific invention, but also substantial industrial capacity and specialized managerial expertise to transition from a prototype item to mass production. This stagnation was resolved by decisive government intervention. In late 1942, Rover agreed to exchange its jet engine factory at Barnoldswick for the Rolls-Royce facility producing the tank engines based on the Merlin piston design. Rolls-Royce, having an unparalleled legacy of high-performance engine manufacturing and industrial standardization, having built over 150,000 Merlin engines during the war, rapidly took charge of the W-2 program in 1943. Rolls-Royce quickly refined and industrialized the W-2 design, bringing the Whittle engine concept into production as the Rolls-Royce Welland. The Welland successfully powered the initial production variants of the Gloucester Meteor F Mark I. The Gloucester Meteor prototype first flew on March 5, 1943, the F Mark I, powered by two Welland turbojets, each producing 1,700 pounds foot of thrust, achieved a top speed of approximately 415 miles per hour or 675 kilometers per hour at 10,000 feet. While this was a technological triumph, the performance was only marginally superior to the best contemporary piston engine fighters, such as the Hawker Tempest and North American P-51 Mustang. Rolls-Royce immediately focused on performance upgrades, leading to the development of the Rolls-Royce Derwent engine an improved version of the W-2 that incorporated a straight-through gas flow system to boost power. The Derwent was ready shortly after the Welland entered service and would define the combatability of the Meteor. Technical and Strategic Divergence Centrifugal Flow versus Axial Flow The defining characteristic of early British jet development was its reliance on the centrifugal flow compressor, a technical decision born partially out of early funding constraints but ultimately serving as a strategic advantage in wartime logistics. This philosophy stood in stark contrast to the German approach which centered on the axial flow compressor. Analyzing this divergence reveals why the Meteor, though aerodynamically conservative, secured a lasting operational legacy. The compressor design trade-offs, the centrifugal flow design used in Whittle's engines offered several pragmatic advantages suitable for rapid wartime deployment. It provided a high pressure rise per stage, operated efficiently across a wide rotational speed range, and was relatively simple to manufacture, resulting in lower cost and better debris resistance. Crucially, the centrifugal design was an evolution of proven supercharger technology, lowering developmental risk. However, its primary disadvantage was the large diameter required, resulting in a wide, high-drag engine face. This required the British airframe designers to mount the engines in external nacelles, instead of integrating them into a sleek fuselage. 
Conversely, the German engines, such as the Junkers Jumo 004 used in the Messerschmitt ME262, employed the axial flow compressor. The axial flow design provided a smaller frontal area, allowing the German aircraft to be sleeker and faster, leading to the ME262 being significantly faster than the Meteor. However, the axial flow design was immensely difficult to manufacture, required complex, high-grade alloys, and offered good efficiency only over a narrow rotational speed range, making throttle response sensitive. Whittle himself had originally included an axial design in his first patent, but abandoned it for the centrifugal concept when faced with the realities of funding and engineering feasibility in the 1930s. This difference in compressor philosophy when combined with the extreme demands of high temperature metals led to a critical divergence in engine reliability and endurance. The complex metallurgy required for the German axial design proved unsustainable under the strains of war production. The simpler, more robust British centrifugal design was far more forgiving. This translated directly into operational sustainability, as demonstrated by the comparison between the initial combat engines. The low time between overhaul or TBO of the Jumo 004B, which was between 0 and 20 hours, made it logistically complex and dangerous to operate, contributing to high pilot loss rates. Conversely, the Welland's 180 hours TBO ensured the Meteor was a highly airworthy, practical military weapon emphasizing reliability. Over speed. The decision by the Ministry of Aircraft Production to keep the jet program secondary to piston engine production until 1943 allowed the British design to benefit from maturing industrial standards, unlike the ME262, which was rushed into service under severe production pressures. In essence, while the ME262 was technically revolutionary, the Meteor represented superior operational utility in a long war of attrition. Operational deployment, the Gloucester Meteor in World War II combat 1944-1945. The Gloucester Meteor F Mark I became the first British jet fighter and the only Allied jet aircraft to achieve combat operations during the Second World War. The aircraft commenced operations on July 27, 1944, with No. 616 Squadron RAF. The deployment of the Meteor was held back by the need to safeguard its technology. The aircraft was restricted to home defence duties over the UK and was not deployed to continental Europe for fear that an intact engine might fall into enemy hands. The Meteor's principal wartime assignment was countering the V-1 flying bomb attacks aimed at London, which had begun in June 1944. The V-1, powered by a pulse jet engine, typically flew at around 400 miles per hour. Although the Meteor F Mark I's maximum speed, 415 miles per hour, was not a massive margin over the faster Allied piston fighters, its sustained high speed at low altitude provided the necessary edge for these interceptions. This deployment decision maximized the jet's strategic utility against a specific low-altitude threat while minimizing the risk to the valuable technology. Number 616 Squadron achieved confirmed success, downing 14 V1s before the launch sites were overrun. This combat period produced one of the most famous early jet encounters. On August 4, 1944, Flying Officer Dean of Number 616 Squadron, unable to fire due to jammed cannons, used the Meteor's superior speed to approach the V-1 and physically tip the missile over with his wingtip. This maneuver disrupted the V-1's gyro compass, sending it crashing to the ground. This incident marks the world's first instance of a jet fighter successfully neutralizing an enemy aircraft, albeit an unmanned one, without firing a shot. The experience with the F-Mark I quickly underscored the need for enhanced performance. The rapid developmental cycle of the jet engine meant that the Welland engine was superseded within months of entering service, the Meteor F Mark III was developed to address these power requirements. The F Mark III was predominantly powered by the Rolls-Royce Derwent I engine, an immediate successor to the Welland. The Derwent I increased thrust significantly to 2,000 foot-pound of thrust per engine, raising the Mark III's maximum speed to 515 miles per hour or 837 kilometers per hour at 10,000 feet. This performance placed it clearly ahead of contemporary Spitfires and Mustangs. The Meteor Mark III later saw further power increases with some aircraft receiving the 2,400 pound-foot of thrust from the Derwent IV engines and aerodynamic enhancements like longer engine nacelles. The rapid transition from the Mark I to the Mark III, enabled by Rolls-Royce's standardization of the W to design, showcased the intense pace of early jet technology development. In January 1945, a flight of Mark III's was deployed to Melsbruck, Belgium. They undertook armed reconnaissance and ground attack missions although they deliberately avoided direct air combat with the German Messerschmitt ME262. The British development of the jet fighter during World War II represents a pivotal chapter in aviation history. 
characterized by initial innovation, the Whittles patent, institutional indifference, strategic acceleration, and ultimately the engineering of Rolls-Royce's industrialization. Historically, the Messerschmitt Me262 is often cited as the more revolutionary aircraft, possessing a faster, aerodynamically superior airframe and leading with axial flow engine technology. However, the Meteor was the long-term operational victor, the technical pragmatism of the British approach prioritizing the reliable, simpler centrifugal flow engine over maximum performance ensured high operational fleet availability, which was a decisive factor in a protracted conflict. As it turns out, the Meteor proved to be both successful and an enduring aircraft. While the ME262 was an inspiring design, its inherent unreliability with a 10 to 20 hours TBO meant it was a technological dead end in operational service. In contrast, the Gloucester Meteor adapted seamlessly to the post-war environment. Its airframe evolved through several variants, notably the Meteor F-8, and served multiple air forces well into the mid-1950s. It saw significant combat duty in the Korean War. Frank Whittle's work established the fundamental engineering principles that powered the Allied transition into the jet age. The successful industrialization of the W-2 into the Welland and Derwent created a highly adaptable family of engines. This lineage culminated in the powerful Rolls-Royce Neen engine, which was copied globally, and helped launch the US Navy's jet fleet and the Soviet Union's early jet program. Beyond military applications, Whittle's pioneering efforts laid the indispensable groundwork for commercial jet travel, directly leading to advancements exemplified by the de Havilland Comet, the world's first commercial jet transport. Whittle was formally recognized for his monumental contributions, he retired from the RAF in 1948 at the rank of Air Commodore and received a knighthood in the same year. He was further granted a financial award of £100,000 by the Royal Commission. The British jet fighter program during World War II, starting from a patent nearly abandoned due to poverty, resulting in not the fastest warplane, but in the most reliable and industrially sustainable one. What's your thoughts on the jet engine race during the war? Do you think Germany or Britain had the right idea? Let me know in the comments below. If you have enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one.